Uh, hello everyone, this is our second edition of the newsletter and today my guest is going to be Nick Bloom. He's the William Everly Professor of Economics at Stanford University and the co-director of the Productivity, Innovation and Entrepreneurship Program at the NBR. He works on management practices and uncertainty and most recently he has this agenda on working from home which is what we are going to discuss today. He worked previously at the UK Treasury and McKinsey and Company. So he has had a fantastic and successful career. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a recipient of the Sloan Fellowship, the Bernasser Prize, the Frisch Medal, and a National Science Foundation Career Award. He graduated with um, a BA from Cambridge, a master from Oxford, and a PhD from UCL. So welcome, Nick Blue. Very <laughs> nice to have you here. <laughs> Sorry for the long introduction. <laughs> Thanks very much. Yeah, and it, on the remote edition, I, you know, talking about working from home, I am actually working from home. It's like, uh, <laughs> this is like a, a weird dormitory I'm in. It's like our spare room is full of adult and kids' beds. So I'm actually I have uh, all the laundry behind that you cannot <laughs> see uh, out of this four, uh, out of this square. <laughs> so I'm in the same situation. So <laughs> that, that opens to, to our discussion. So before the pandemic, less than 8% of people were able to work from home and firms really, really didn't like it because they thought, you know, people would not be productive or they would shirk or they would not communicate well. Sometimes we didn't even have the technology to do it. But kind of one way or another, the pandemic forced us to adapt to this and work from home. So my first question is, do you think that after the pandemic is over, you know, we are going to keep working from home? Is this something that is here to stay? or we are going to go back to status quo from before. You're right. Um, why don't I, absolutely, absolutely. So why don't I quickly, I'm gonna share two slides uh, to answer this. So maybe that's easy. So I'll share screen now. Uh, okay. So, okay, here we go. Yeah, I can see. So um, this is actually, I had a five slides. I gave this presentation to uh, a group of executives, actually. This is very, very low tech. Um, but it, it does the job perfectly. So um, I'm going to talk about just the first trend, which is uh, working from home over time. But I've been working with Jose Barrera and Steve Davis on this survey of 2,500 working age adults per month with the Atlanta Fed in Chicago. We've also been surveying a lot of US firms, in fact, some, a bunch of UK firms as well. And we're using a lot of other data. So I wanted to show you the first trend, which is exactly on your question. So here's from the survey that Jose and Steve, uh, we've been asking 2,500, in fact, in the most recent few months, it's moved up to 5,000 people a month. Uh, we're using an online internet survey, which, you know, for researchers, is kind of an interesting side issue. Is I only got into this because one of my PhD students, Jack Blundell, uh, about a year ago started doing this. And I'd heard about it from another academic, Evan Starr at Maryland, and I always pondered about this. It's this thing whereby you pay people basically you go to a firm like Inquiry or Question Pro or Prolific, you pay typically $2 per response and you get a, re a panel of respondees. And it's very fast, very easy. There's a lot of concern about responsiveness. You know, I could talk yeah, about... We right. basically... I mean, who is spending time answering all these surveys? You're exactly right. So, you know, on observables, we reweight the current population survey. In fact, even unweighted looks quite similar to the US population. It's kind of quite odd you'd wonder who the high income people in particular are filling this out um when you ask them one of the questions you had in one month and evan starts on a bunch of the stuff you ask them why they do it partly is interest partly money um there are other questions people have been doing uh like there's the dallas fed with alec flick and others have looked at replicating the cps and it actually does a pretty good job you know the other thing in their defense is that's what was used for the 2020 polling so initially you think 2020 was like a terrible disaster. The polling was <laughs> awful. Uh, it wasn't, I mean, he's discussed how bad and good it was, but if you, for example, just to plot predicted Trump share uh, versus actual on a county by county basis, it's very good. So I don't, you know. So it's the, as the, good the, as we can get probably. Yeah, it, people used to do what's called random digit dial or stopping people on the street, but both of those are more problematic now. 
So like, yeah, now people don't yeah. work and nobody answers the phone anymore. So <laughs> Yeah, so for academics, I don't want to claim it's perfect by any means. This is far from perfect. You're exactly right. I mean, it's basically overweight on people, even based on observables, are like to use the internet. So but do you tell them what these ask questions are for? So do you know that they are replying for a study on this topic by these people? So do they get all the information? Um, Respondents. Good question. I mean, we start off, we just ask them, you know, you start off with the basic questions, age, gender. Uh, and then we start asking, are you working? How many days a week? Where are you working? How much is working from home? How efficient? It's just a whole battery of questions. And they get $2. Um, it should take them about eight minutes. So I, I kind of raise it as a, it's a useful research tool. You can literally code the thing. You know, having done this, you want to pilot a lot. So the first five or six iterations, you just made mistakes. I mean, I coded it up myself. It's in Qualtrics. It's not very difficult to do. So you put the thing in and you discover, I mean, there's little things like you, you can imagine, right? Whenever you code these things up, you make errors and the answers come back. So I did like five or six in a row where I did. But because questions. of the way you ask the questions or just like, bugs in the code uh early on it's bugs uh you just make mistakes there are other things like i was doing something in the uk and i was porting it over to the us and i forgot to change the word postcode to zip code that's just you know <laughs> some people have no idea what you're talking about well you know interesting enough prolific which is one of the people that do that there's a little message option and i now always read the messages because they're full of all kinds of interesting comments and people give feedback and then there are more subtle versions like you do a b testing so we had tested out working, asking how many days you work from home and a different, how many days are you going to work from home post pandemic? And a different question, how many days you could commute to the workplace? So you should think they should give you the same answer. They don't exactly because of differences in interpretation. And you also have to deal with things like self-employed people. Uh, or people you know, that get... don't commute often. So, right? Yeah. I, you know, people that commute the... only a few days, not all the days. There are all sorts of deals, even pre-pandemic. Exactly right. So I'm going to, you know, push to the side. I raised it for academics out there that it's actually really quite a cool tool and I've been using it. It's fast, cheap and pretty efficient. I wouldn't say it's perfect, but, you know, it's worth thinking about. If you want to collect a lot of data very fast, it's a good way to do it. So anyway, what do we actually find coming back to the results? Um, here is if you look, this is the Y axis is the percentage of full paid days that are work from home. So I, I get that. You know, everyone works from home in the morning and evenings and weekends. We basically, since we want to think about office space and commuting, it's the full day and it has to be paid. Before COVID, it's taken from the 2017-2018 American Time Use Survey. It's a fantastic survey, 10,000 wage and salaried Americans. That number is 5%. So there are different ways to break it down. Just before I move on, you can also ask people as they do, how many people ever work from home a full paid day? You know, even if it's once every three or four months, and that's 15%. But most people that, so 85% of people before pandemic never worked from home ever. 15% did. Of that 15%, 2% to a small share did it full time. The other 13% were anything from one to four days a week. Do you know Actually, what type of jobs were there, those 2%? Uh, yes. So again, working from home pre and during and also post pandemic has hugely correlated with education. So they're highly likely to be graduate jobs. Um, a lot of them, much from anecdote, I know were people that moved location. So I actually know three or four people pre-pandemic that worked entirely from home. So, um, <clears throat> for example, Petra Moser, her, who moved from Stanford to NYU, her husband worked, I believe it was in Cisco, for several years then they moved to New York and I think he was primarily working from home. And I have several friends like that. So they moved in kind of high level grad jobs, um, and they keep working for the same employer. It, there are also firms, there's a friend of mine, Christy Johnson, she runs, a, she's ex-McKinsey, she runs a management consulting firm that is called Artemis Consulting that is entirely work from home. They recruit people from the get-go. I see it to do it from home, yes. But that's really rare. It's very you know, rare. Partly yeah. it's intriguing talking. So before pandemic, you know, it's very easy to get such. So before pandemic, 5% of the days were working from home. Pretty rare, pretty small deal. During the pandemic, at the height of the first lockdown, you can see it went over 60%. That's partly because a lot of people lost their jobs. And of those that were left, the majority working from home. So working from home has been quite astoundingly a huge, you know, you think of us, it called non, I've forgotten the word for it, like non-pharmaceutical uh, defenses. Interventions. <laughs> That's it. It's a huge issue. 
if we couldn't work from home, you'd have been stuffed with, you know, the choice between going to the workplace and get potentially infected or just not work. But anyway, throughout the pandemic, including now, this is March data. It's not that, you know, it's pretty recent. We're running mm. April. It's in the field currently. Uh, about 50% of Americans are working from home. And this is full time. So it's 50% of working day. So, and then post pandemic, it drops down to around 20%. This is, we asked people, what has your employer told you? We also had the separate firm level survey. I mean, wait, sorry, I'll interrupt you here. So post pandemic, you mean when you think the pandemic is over or like what's the horizon? Yeah, sorry. We, we, have, we are not in post pandemic yet, so. You're exactly right. Um, so we asked them post pandemic in 2022 plus, um, yes. how many days a week uh, has your employer indicated you will be working from home? And if they say, don't know, as in my employer hasn't told me, we give them a zero. Now, I know that's a bit okay. conservative, but I think that's probably correct at this point in time. Um, just to give you some confidence, that 20% number, we separately asked around 1,000 firms for this Atlanta Fed Chicago Stanford survey, this thing called the Survey of Business Uncertainty, of firms, how many, what your, for your employees, and we get a very similar 20% number. So I think it's about right. And the way to think about it, it's quite interesting. There's an extensive and an intensive margin adjustment. So during the pandemic, 50% of people roughly are working from home and they're doing it full time. So me, you, probably, honestly, almost everyone listening to this because they're yes. still going to be <laughs> grads, post grads, are, are going to be working from full time. Post pandemic, that same 50% is going to make an adjustment on the intensive margin to going from five days a week on average to two. So and the other 50% never did, never is, and never will basically work from home. And you can imagine they're like people working in frontline retail, manufacturing, exactly. healthcare. Healthcare, yeah. Although now so, we have telehealth, so even that is not obvious, right? So because Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, if we come back to talk about um, impacts of the pandemic, precisely right. Some, there is some job and task redesign. You know, my neighbor, actually, if I turn my camera around, I can see her house. So I live on Stanford campus and Terry, <laughs> my neighbor, she lives across the road. She's a, a doctor. And um, she was telling me uh, that, of course, as soon as before pandemic, I remember talking to her, she said that PAMF, our local health clinic, part of Sutter Health, was trying to move people to online telehealth. But the big barrier was billing, that people could come in for things that, like collecting a test result and it's negative. You just want to know the result. But exactly. if they did it online, you couldn't bill people. Whereas suddenly that restriction got changed under the pandemic. You can now bill people for telehealth properly. Exactly. You know, all the insurers will pay for it. And you can also do it cross state border. So it used to be if someone happened to be in Arizona, that was a real problem for her, but because she wasn't licensed. To, anyway, all of that's gone. So now telehealth is, yeah, that's going to be, but that group, I mean, it's a small share of our population. But, but th be. that's why, because of all these technological changes we implemented to be able to work from home, I mean, we are using Zoom that, we've never used before like this extensively i'm a bit surprised that that there is the expectation that only about 20 percent. i mean do you think this is a big number or a small number i would have expected a much larger number actually i actually think it's the efficient number so um it's a huge thing just to give you trends before the pandemic working from home was already rising it was roughly doubling every 12 years so it would have taken 25 years of natural growth if you extrapolate. And that's a pretty, you know, that's a pretty heroic extrapolation, but who knows? So on current trends, uh, so I see that as a very large increase from 5 to 20% back. But you're, then the question is, why has it dropped back? I, I'm, you know, weirdly under this pandemic, I, it's the first time ever I felt like research has been totally connected to kind of managers. So I speak, so, I spend so much time probably talk to, a couple, you know, one or two managers a day right now. Some of it can mostly just, you know, like weird discussion, people can't reach out. But uh, the big trade off from, for firms, for folks like us post pandemic is it's more efficient, it seems to be, in terms of innovation and creativity to be face to face. But it's more efficient for doing individual tasks on your own to be at home. Not you also save the commute. So and the, wait a second, and also there is the issue of rent, right? They have not, they have gotten rid of some office space. They have not been paying rent. So I can imagine places like New York, San Francisco, this is like a big cost to get back to. Or is that uh, not important to them? No, it is. So 
the you, so this this is a complicated so there are kind of three levels here. So, so one question is what's the efficient days to be working in the office? So the normal view is that I'd say eighty percent of firms I've talked to, and it, and it comes out in our survey is they're going to do something like three days a week in the office, two days a week at home post pandemic. Ah, uh, the reason is. You can just apply like the task-based model, the auto levy name, say task-based model, and think about breaking out what we do throughout the day into tasks. So we have meetings, we have group events, things that we've got to do with other people, and then we have stuff that we do individually on our own, like you know, writing emails, reading reports, for example. And the group events we just relocate in the week. So we do them all say on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and the whole team and everyone comes in on those days. There's no loss. We're all face to face. The individual event, the individual tasks like reading reports or doing, you know, yeah, paperwork. you're rather not interrupted by other people. You're more efficient doing it at home. Yes. Exactly right. And you just you do that Wednesday, Friday, and you just don't go into the office. So that's like the best of both worlds. You know, in you're more productive because you're um, on your home days, and you lose no productivity in your work days because you're there as ever before. So, oh, I could stop sharing it. So I didn't realize I'm sharing. So. Um, that would increase um, productivity. So that's the reason why most people think they're going to do three days a week in the office, two days a week at home. Post pandemic, then you raise another issue about office space. That gets more complicated. Exactly. So, you know, this is like another long literature in economics between decentralization and centralization. You know, going back to Hayek and command, there's a complete trade off, and firms have different views on this. So, one view is let's let, let each team make its decision. So you, Marina, you have your team and you go sp reach out to every member of your team and you say, we all need to come in on the same days because that's much more efficient. We, but what days do we want to come in on? And I think we probably want to come in on three, but does anyone want to push for four versus two? And you have a discussion and your team decides, hey, look, let's all come in Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We're going to take Monday, Friday and work at home. Fine. So that's one view. That's great. The problem is you can't really save much office space that way. Exactly. So, you pay the Plus, if you need to cross team work then that doesn't work either it's like a mess exactly right so that's one view and it depends on how much decentralization and flexibility and preferences matter the alternative is you do it from the center it's a bit like a teaching matrix you kind of you go back and forth the center makes the plan it pushes it down to the managers checks with them whether they're okay they totally violently disagree it re, you know goes up and down but that way you then have a uniform distribution across days that people work from home and then you can shrink office space a bit. But that does require some centralization. So not, firms differ on that. And it depends, honestly, how much they care about choice and flexibility versus how expensive their office space is and how much people need to be in a cross team. But you wouldn't see then some firms moving totally, um, working from home and some firms moving totally. So you think that most likely some form of hybrid with an unknown uh, distribution of uh, responsibilities and decision-making power. Um, yeah, so the, the, I, the sorry, I looked, so the, the evidence is, there's two sources of evidence that are really useful. One is Zillow data, uh, which is property transaction data we're looking at. And the other is US Postal Service change of address data. And in both cases, what we see is pretty clear evidence. In fact, I can screen share again. I got the Zillow stuff here. So if we go down, here we go. So this is the Zillow data. Um, if you look here, this is, looks at, and the top is purchase prices from the Zillow home value index. And then the lower one is rental prices. This is and a firm you, space or housing space? This is households. Okay. So this is on households, and I'll talk to you a bit about firms in a minute, because we have, for Zillow, I have the household data is much better, because the commercial property market is kind of in a stasis. It's in a kind of deep slumber. Not surprising, no one is signing or buying much commercial property. So the transaction volume is so down that you can't really do much with it. But you can on the residential. So what you see is maybe not surprising to anyone is what we call the donut effect, which is the center of large US cities. Uh, you know, we have the 12 largest ones here. You can imagine San Francisco, New York, Chicago, et cetera. The central business districts are doing really badly because no one wants to live there. It's not just rental. They're doing really badly in purchase prices, whereas the outer suburbs are doing really well. And, it, you know, this is like economic 101. If you only got to commute into the office three days a week, 
you are less bothered about a long commute, you also want more space at home. So collectively that pushes Especially you Especially in a pandemic where you can't go out and <laughs> you're probably very crowded and none of the city amenities can be used. Yeah, exactly. That's why I think the rental response is much larger. But you notice the purchase response is quite big. I mean, if you look at the over one year, the price gap that's opened up is almost 10%. That's a pretty big difference. Whereas these guys you can see beforehand were basically tracking each other. This is within the same city. By the so way, if you look at permanent across, relocation for individuals. So basically, in workers fled cities, moved to the suburbs. Now it's not going to be that easy to move them back, I guess. No, I think it's permanent. I think, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I think it's probably quite good, honestly. It's so to be clear, they're not moving across cities. So there's two very different pieces of analysis. One is within each city, which is what this is doing, and we're only looking at the 12 mm. largest cities. The second is, are they moving from New York to say Topeka, Kansas? And the answer is no, on average, they're not. So if you do a, a graph, I haven't included it here, but you do a graph of the change in price city by city against the baseline price, it's totally flat. So it's not that cheap cities like Topeka are going up and expensive cities like New York are going down. There's no correlation. It's within basically large cities, people are moving up. Um, the other data I haven't shown you here, just um, we have, we just got actually literally this week was the US Postal Service change of address data, which is fascinating. And it has both households and businesses, and it has both temporary and permanent. Because people wow, either, that's amazing. You can either say, I, you know, Marina, I temporarily want to forward my mail because I'm going to go live in you know, Hawaii for a year, or you can permanently move. What you see in that on the household is the same as this. There's a huge flow of people permanently and temporarily relocating their mail out if they live in city center zip codes. But we also see the same for businesses. The thing that's a bit more striking is, a large number of businesses have permanently moved their address out of city centers. So I think exactly as you say, city centers are going down in price. It may unwind 10, 20 years of city growth. So again, I'm not sure it's bad, just as the backdrop is city centers have become relatively more expensive. Or so relocation, they, or the, now we're in a transition where some firms just change the technology and move into the suburbs, and then you give rise to other types of businesses that arise in city centers. But, totally. Yeah. So, the, I mean, this again is, you know, when you talk to journalists, they often say, does that mean the city centers will be deserted? It's like, <laughs> no, it just means the rents and the valuations will go down. So, of course, if the rents and the prices of real estate in city centers goes down by a third, A, different people move in, and everyone on average has slightly larger apartments. So density is a bit down, but it's not zero. I mean, you, you know, there's no, there might be a few artists and you know, artisans in New York in the way there were in probably 1990 and 2000, and now it's too expensive. That's Unless true. companies want to go back eventually. So I guess we, go back, we round back to the question of it will depend on whether workers are being recalled or not after the pandemic. Yeah, so then uh, the paper I wrote with Jose and Steve Davis is called Why Working From Home Will Stick, and it comes back to that original 20% number. And your mm -hmm. question, why doesn't it go back to 5% pre-pandemic? And, you know, I can give you a quick, there's like five factors that we put in the paper. I don't remember if I can even remember all of them, but one is stigma. So firms, there's a reports of way less negative stigma about working from home. That shirking from home thing is gone. The second is efficiency. So firms report that they're, it's turning out to be far more efficient working from home than they expected. There's also what's called the two-arm bandit problem that a lot of firms have experimented and some on the tail find it's great and will stick. Uh, the third is innovation. So there's been huge amounts of pro working from home innovation. So if you look at in the US patent office, so another project of Euler's S. Cover, you see that the number of patents that mention working from home is like exploded in the pandemic. So make it easier and more efficient, yes. Exactly. It will get better and better. The fourth is co-investment. So we estimate from the survey something like 1% of GDP has been invested by households on equipment and time to get working from up and running at home. Like, you know, I bought a proper mic. Uh, and a Me too. Yeah. I have all the, I have the system yeah, now, which I didn't have before. And I have this. My desk can go up or down. I mean, I'm not, you know, it's going to be a bit weird, but I would never have done that. There would be no point, but... So there's a lot of, and then uh, finally, hey, the final one is kind of most interesting. Come back to your comment earlier about, we ask people, I, I, the final one I call fear of proximity. So I ask people post pandemic, uh, after you have a vaccine, 
what activities you go back to, and there's a list of them, and it goes from kind of more and more proximity. Over 75% of people re re report, at least now, they will not go back to getting on crowded subway trains and in elevators. And, you know, is that true? It's hard to tell. After 9-11, there was a big permanent drop in air travel. It took three years to get back to the previous trend. I think there'll be a lot of people who are going to be very nervous. You know, you saw a few days ago, the CDC reported you can still get infected with the vaccine. I know. It's a very small percentage, but I, know, I totally that's agree. So look, <laughs> I, I, you know, we had flu already before. I say, look, my own personal view is when we're vaccinated, you know, we can go out and return to normal. But that's Actually, definitely the, not... the fear factor is important. So when you look, for example, at the Google data on mobility, so we, we were working with this with Alessandra Foley, uh, Fabrizio Perry and Mark Ponder, and, and we were looking at the Google data in New York at the beginning of the pandemic. And you see that the day they announced that maybe they close school, people stopped going shopping. And it was way before they actually imposed the, the constraints of 75 of people must remain home. So people just got scared and, and stopped doing a lot of activities that they thought would be risky. So, so there is a sense in which if it totally. takes too long to make sure this is not going to go away, maybe people are, are, are going to be scared of doing some activities or working next to a co-worker. No, you're completely right. I mean, that's what the surveys suggest. And you know, everyone has their own views on this. Um, so what, I, do you I, think, what do you think this is going to imply for the education sector? Because we used to be, you know, in very crowded classrooms. Then we move to online. Would it, it work better or worse in different places? Do you think we'll go back to classrooms? Do you think we'll go back to having a hybrid teaching system? Probably. I mean, I, you had the same experience. My own preference is for Stanford, they mandate everyone gets vaccinated, then we just go back to before. We, we, exactly as before, without masks. I, I just, I, I, so personally, I've taught on Zoom. It was okay. I'd say it's five or six out of 10. If 10 out of 10 is in person, it wasn't terrible. It wasn't a disaster. I, you know, I felt like one of these firms, it wasn't a disaster I feared it would be, but it was clearly less good than in person. So, um, and I think once we're vaccinated, the risk from, I mean, COVID I think is very low and there's huge costs for not meeting in person. So I just don't think the cost benefit, and, but I, I don't know. I don't know what the university's plan. I mean, as far as I know, a lot of discussion is we'll go back in the fall, but wearing masks. I suspect that won't work very well because it's harder to communicate. To if you wear glasses yeah. like me, they fog up. So I probably would rather go to a Zoom seminar than go in person in one of masks. And I suspect a lot of people will have the same view. So then we'll have what's called mixed mode, which is just horrible. So that won't work, you know. That mixed doesn't mode, work but, very well. Yeah, but exactly. On the so, other hand, it also depends on, on, on your student body because if student, some students, Low income students don't need to pay housing. They might want the option of doing things online. I mean, you may be open to open education to a much wider no, that, audience. That's completely correct. So I was, you know, for Stanford, uh, where it's a residential university experience and you're paying that. Exactly. But you're completely correct that much like with firms, there'll be a huge amount of innovation. And so there's a lot of schools, for example, that are now going to be Zoom schools. And that's good. I mean, look, if you're out in the countryside or imagine you're working overseas in a multinational or in an area where the local schools are really poor, exactly. it may well be better to have Zoom school. I totally agree. Or you can have supplementary schooling and the same with the university. So I'm completely on board with that. Um, so I think much like with businesses, we see it go from five to 20% of people working from home. I wouldn't be surprised with education. It goes from 1% to 8% of, you know, school days at home. I think there's still the majority of in the classroom. Another big issue that's come up is this is a hugely complementary of good performance management. So oddly enough, I actually interviewed Marissa Mayer, who was the CEO of Yahoo. She ran it in 2013 when they banned working from home. And it's this huge media I school. remember. Yeah, it was a big yeah. news then. Yeah, exactly right. So that I went back and interviewed her about six, nine months ago. I reached out to her and you know, she eventually agreed to talk to me. Her story about what happened in Yahoo in 2013 was fascinating. Again, it was like personal economics, you know, in reference in some parts of, you know, Eddie Luzier, who sadly just passed away. But the story was, look, you can monitor people on inputs. So you can, in the office, like, are you, Marina, sitting in your chair, typing away furiously, appear to be working hard? Or are you kind of goofing off and snoring? Or you can monitor people on outputs, which is, are you producing what you're supposed to be doing? 
Exactly. If you input monitor, which is basically deemed bad management, everything I've done, then it's horrible working from home because you can't see them. And exactly. firms that do that have adopted this kind of nasty surveillance software. It takes screen. Yeah, where well, you have to log in and they check yeah, how many exactly hours right. you're in and it's like they're going back to the cards. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So input monitoring is awful, whereas output monitoring works really well from working from home. You just say, sure, go home, do whatever you want, as long as you continue to perform, you're fine. So there's a huge complementarity. And not surprisingly, you see in data already coming out that if you look at firms by their performance management scores, Beforehand, better firms are obviously doing a bit better already, but the exactly. pandemic and the thing totally bifurcates. So if you have good performance management, it's not really been a problem. If you have bad performance management, it's been horrible. And so there's a strong complementarity, and I'm sure HR consultants are going to do very well in the next you know, two years putting this stuff in place. And that was Marissa Mayer's story. She said when she took over at Yarn in 2013, they had bad performance management because they had problems with the CEOs. She'd come mm -hmm. in, put in this you know, aggressive system, when it was up and running, she then allowed people to return to working from home, but like two, three days a week. So totally on, it was like a perfect example of what's <laughs> happening now. It's like, I completely agree. That's exactly what, you know, firms are doing now. And what she did in 2013 was recall people that were five days a week at home who had no performance management. And she said, when the reason she did it, she looked at their login data and there are people that hadn't logged in for like nine or 10 days. They're wow. full-time employees. They have not turned on their computer for night. You're like, what are they doing? It's not like they're not doing much work. They're literally doing none. <laughs> exactly. um, yeah. So I don't know. Let, let's see. But uh, I think it's going to be, it, it's a fantastic avenue of research. I mean, I think this is going to be, it's a big experiment that we are doing. I mean, we, yeah. and we are changing as oh, we go. Oh. Yeah, I mean, the, the other thing to say is one of the very few upsides of the pandemic will be the big increase in working from home post pandemic. I think it's going to be a welfare improving. In our surveys, employees report they value it the same as about an 8% pay increase, which in fact, amazingly, is almost identical to the number that Alex Mass and Mandy Pillay came out in the AR paper in 2017. They did an RCT on, I, mean, I won't go through the details. But did you estimate, do you have a good way to estimate change in productivity or is it perceived? Oh, okay. This is valuation. So there's two very different. Oh, so this valuation, is, company valuation. Yeah. No, you're, you're correct. You're totally right. To, so on the valuation, we ask people, uh, again, this is what they tell us. You know, the, this is where the mass and palais is nice because it's actual choice data. But we asked them, post-pandemic, if you're allowed to work from home two days a week, do you think it's good? You know, you like it, neutral, don't like it. And if they say positive or negative, we say how much and give them a whole bunch of numbers. I see. For equivalent salary and the average is plus 8%. Which makes about set, which makes about sense. On productivity, we also ask them that that is roughly zero. It's very mildly positive. The big issue is on short versus long. So I think short run, like doing the same thing we've ever done, works fine. We just keep going with tasks. You know, most yeah. kids are. So, I get kids. Are, are, I was going to ask. We'll go back to that in a second. But so. kids is a huge issue. But this, we're asking them about post COVID. You know, my the kids thing. It's why I have stuff like this lying next to my desk, you know, like I look, just all my room is full of my youngest keeps coming. It's very sweet. But yeah, kids is a big issue. I totally get that. Post pandemic, though, most people view when kids are back at school, productivity on the current tasks is probably up at home because you can focus and you save on commute. Just to be exactly. clear, commute, if you work eight hours a day and commute one hour a day. If you're no longer commuting, you've gained you over get that one hour time. and you're not tired and you're going to be it's huge. And, it's at, and also other things like it I, in the C-Trip study where we were recording people's data phone calls by minute. Other things that maybe seem not a big deal, but like going to the toilet, getting lunch, uh, chatting to people. Those things add up to quite a lot of time delays. So you're really more, fish and eating and you're at your desk yeah, at home. It's horrible, but you know, you're... Uh, so actually people are more productive on their current activities working from home. The problem is, it seems to be, and the de this research on this is not as, there's no RC, you know, I, I, I agree with it, but it, it's more of an open question. It's a good area to do, but the research on uh, creativity and innovation suggests it's not as good if you're at home. And that would be my pro. So we didn't discuss it before, but uh, how about males versus females? Do you have any sense... <laughs> So the, it's very, so most, so, okay, I'll say, say three points. One is the, by, by far the largest divide on anything we see in the data is by education. So I'll talk about gender. 
that education just trumps anything. If you want to look at an R squared, say, on do you work from home or do you like working from home? Is it productive? Education has like 10x anything else. So, and the reason is, coming back to what we talked about earlier, is it totally predicts what task you do. So exactly. if you're a grad, you're likely to be working on a computer, you can do it remotely. If you left school at 16, you're probably doing something physical and you can't. So then on gender, most of the gender stuff is surprisingly relatively insignificant. And we keep hmm. looking at this. There is one ar- angle I'll show in a minute that is significant, but mostly it's relatively insignificant. It's not to say it's zero, but the magnitudes. You know, I, we thought that, for example, women or women and kids may report more negative experiences. They don't massively. I don't know why. I mean, I, I'd say what we find in the data, the one area where there is a significant difference, a screen share that is worrying, and it's a, it relates to a lot of advice I've been given to companies, is uh, this. Okay. Let me show you two slides. Let's go. So here we go. We asked people so similarly in, across data. We asked people how many days a week would you like to work post COVID? You notice that it's almost, a, you know, it's kind of like a uniform density, it's about as maximum variation as you could get. If I showed you that support, how could you maximize the variation in opinion? This looks a lot like it. So 30% of people want to work from home forever. You know, don't want to stop post pandemic and 20% like never again. I cannot spend a single more day working in my toilet. So that's, that's the first thing is a big spread. And this is kind of causing friction a bit. The thing that's more striking on gender is if you look at post COVID, you break it down by gender. If you look at uh, graduates, which is about two thirds of our response thing. So people with one plus year, well, people with one plus year of college and people with children under the age of 12, there is quite a big difference in gender between the choice to work from home five days a week. So you can see women have yeah. almost 50% higher preference than men. So the reason this is a big issue is if firms let people choose which days they work from home. And as we know from a lot of research data, if you're in a team where you work from home four days a week. So in C-Trip, when we randomized it, I did this RCT a few years ago that was published in the QJE. We found that people that work from home four days a week had almost half the promotion rate of people that were in the office five days a week. So the gender gap is going to blow up here. If you let people choose. So that's the, that's the, this is the, I'd say by far the biggest uh, debate in the corporate world that companies have a view on is the trade off between these two slides. Choice. So this view, this slide says let people choose. Some people, you know, are desperate to come back to work. Why not let them? Other people loathe it and let them work from home five days a week. So initially, you think we should totally do it. There's a lot of welfare money left on the table if we force everyone in for two days a week. Some people really have very different views. The problem is it collides into this, that if you do that, you discover that it's not just women with young kids. It's also going to be disabled people, people living far from the office. There'll be a whole bunch of demographics that are going to be associated with working from home four or five days a week. That group is not going to get promoted at nearly the rate. Five, mm-hmm. 10 years from now, we're going to have you know, a diversity crisis. So my advice, actually, I'll stop sharing. My advice has been not to let people choose. And it seems very authoritarian. But because I can, I'm more yeah, in the long run, it's going to be give more equitable outcomes. Yes, and uh, even for firms, you know, just from managers' perspective, one is they lose diversity, which is a cost, and two, they're going to face a whole slew of lawsuits. Correct, appropriately. I mean, if you look at the data, you're going to find, you know, you can predict exactly what will be in the data. So. Mm-hmm. I keep suggesting, look, go for three days a week and force everyone to do that. There are some people that want five. There are some that want zero. Don't let them choose because you can imagine it'll be all single young men in the office, <laughs> women with young kids. You know, you can know what's going to happen. It's quite kind of predictable. Exactly. From the day. So for someone that is thinking about trying to study this, what would be your suggestions of avenue of, of research or what are interesting ideas that you thought would be worth exploring by some you know, young assistant professor, grad student that is interested in this working from home revolution? Um, you, I mean, it's a fantastic topic because it just hits everything. And also you have a really nice exogenous, uh, so you know, often when you go to apply micro seminars, is the thing exogenous, does the exclusion restriction hold? On the first, yes. And this is so, an MIT shock by definition, yes. Yes, it's like totally unpredicted, exactly right. It's a perfect MIT shock. The problem, and so in that sense, is ideal. And so if it were me, I'd try and just get variation to look at, you know, high versus low income or good or bad broadband. Or, you know, there's so many, I mean, people have so many great ideas and it's already stuff flooding out. 
the only the only thing just to be aware of, I guess, would be what else changed at the same time. So what makes it slightly tricky is this fear of infection and you know customer. So one of the things you notice is firms that have employees working from home have done a lot better. So there's a paper by I'm trying to remember all the co-authors. Dimitris Papanikolou is one of them. I can't remember who the others were, but I'm, I'm embarrassed. There's somebody I'm, I'm misrepresenting their paper, but if I remember right. They looked at firms by the type of occupations they had and whether people can work from home. And those that can work from home did a lot better in the pandemic relatively in the stock market. One story is it's easier for employees to work from home. Of course, the other story is if you're in a firm where you can work from home, it's probably like your, your services or goods can also be provided remotely. Exactly. So if, you're a, ex if you're a dentist, there's not much you can do. <laughs> yeah, and so that's kind of the exclusion restriction problem. So. I think working from home, much like there's going to be a massive amount of papers, there were on financial frictions. You know, I know your stuff on you know, partisan fighting after Trump as well. These events generate lots of interest and lots of variation. Um, you know, I, I would start with just, you know, one angle is occupations. It, it turns out working from home is highly correlated to occupation and education. That gives a nice angle to vary things over and then really go from there. Okay. Thanks for being with us and for all the insights and let's see what happens. I mean, we'll, we'll learn pretty soon <laughs> in the fall if we are back to normal or not. Exactly right. Hey, thanks very much, Marina. Love to catch up again. Bye-bye. Mm,